There was an American company, I was reading in the Wall Street Journal just last week, um, that has had to shut down, I believe. I don't know if you heard the same story um, because of the Chinese imports. And again, I'm not sure how that all gets played out given the current tariffs and situation. But, you know, how difficult is it to actually reshore some of this manufacturing? I mean, we talked about it being wishful thinking to a degree, but we also need it from a security perspective. Yeah, so the U.S., you know, you know, we can look at this later on and say the naming was poor, but things like the Inflation Reduction Act, right, which were truly meant to, to spur this on. You look at the CHIPS Act, which was also meant to bring in some ability for, think about it as, as a way to get away from the exposure to um, a Taiwan event, um, essentially. Right, these will take a long time to come through. Building a, a chip fab is incredibly difficult. It's mm -hmm. you need the, you need workers, you need to know how the technology. It's really difficult to do. So I think there's a runway there for these to be ramped. It's not going to be tomorrow. And even then, if you look at the amount that the U.S. has allocated, just take the Chips Act to try to get some independence from China around some of this. And certainly, when I say China, I mean Taiwan. Um, it's it will maybe take a 10% reduction in the exposure. So it's not going to do a lot, but it will do something. So chips clearly are one that I think is something to watch. You will see either administration potentially uh, continue to ban um, very high-end processors. You have a ban in place now. Uh, a lot of companies have gotten around it, but I think that that's going to be a narrative regardless of who wins in the U.S. side. Um, and then I'd say it's not out of the question, back to what you said earlier, that China starts to retaliate in different ways. Today, the retaliation has been kind of soft relative to what um, tariffs have been put in place. But if you think about it, and they basically say, hey, we don't think Apple should sell products in China, right? What does that do to U.S. Right. companies who, so there's a whole other game at, that could be played here. But I, I do think um, the reshoring thing, I think it has a ways to go, and I, I understand why. I think it's going to take a long time to really feel that independence for what you need, and certainly on the technology side. I'd say the second place is on healthcare. People don't realize a lot of drugs and pharmaceuticals are actually outsourced. So again, you want to bring some of those supply chains to friendlier places so that you don't have some of the issues that could pop up if the Chinese do take a hard line on retaliating. Mm -hmm. Do you then think what we're essentially saying is deglobalization to a large degree? Mm -hmm. that, that's been happening. It's likely going to continue to happen. What do you think that looks like? Does it also mean de-dollarization? Like where does your head go as a CEO and CIO when you think this trend continues? I think let's take the latter one. De-dollarization, I think, is going to take decades. It will happen. Um, things like the Ukraine war in Russia, right, have spurred people to trade oil and, and use different currencies. Forever in our lifetimes, oil was traded in U.S. dollars. Now people are accepting different currencies, right? That won't go back. You've seen trading blocks emerge. You know, take a look again at Russia and Ukraine. The Latin American countries did not support Ukraine in this. They've supported Russia because of some of their connectivity there. And so you're, you're seeing different trading blocks also emerge mm -hmm. um, as a result of some of these geopolitical events. You've seen India, which has kind of stayed in the middle of a lot of these conflicts, uh, right? A big beneficiary. They've been able to buy Russian oil cheap and export it back to Europe under right. these sanctions, so which have arguably not worked. But this idea of deglobalization, I think, is real. And I think it's not just the U.S. I think it's going to be a lot of other developed countries right now looking at saying, and, and a lot of it is this populist movement. A lot of it has to do with people's fears around immigration and other things. So I don't know that mm -hmm. uh, it's just the U.S., uh, but I do agree that in the last two years, or maybe probably COVID, that this deglobalization move, I think, has gotten some momentum behind it. And it's not just mm -hmm. the U.S. It will be other big mm -hmm. G7 countries as well. And it's really something new that we have to incorporate and think about into our investment process and our positioning. And so with that said, the program is called The Buck Stops Here. We've talked a lot about volatility and what to lean into into the election. Um, what, what else would you say to our viewers? You know, they're investors, they're Canadians, they're business people. Um, what's the word of wisdom? To end yeah, I think, I think we're, we're trying to bet now whether we can navigate the, the quote unquote soft landing. Right. You know, if you're thinking that we have to cut rates in the U.S., just take the U.S. and, and even Canada something that looks like eight times between here and the end of 2025, we will have a problem. 
So I, I think, you know, we got to lower rates. We've got to keep demand back. And I think, you know, that's going to be tricky to navigate. In the first instance, if things weaken too directly, we're going to we're going to be aggressive cutting rates out will be bad for markets. Ultimately, I think markets trade higher through the end of this election period. But there's going to be a lot of volatility in that. So own your fixed income portfolio. Love your fixed income portfolio right now. Try to find hedges within your equity portfolio. OK, we'll leave it there. Kevin, great to see you. Thank you. Catherine, always good to see you. Be well. Thank you.